Welcome to Voice Bootcamp, a global name in unified communication. Hello, my name is Faisal Khan, CEO and founder of Voice Bootcamp. In this chapter of CCNA and CCNP collaboration, we're going to focus on understanding the component of Cisco Unified Communication. Under the umbrella of Cisco Unified Communication or Cisco Unified Collaboration, there are various applications that works together. And we're going to explore some of those applications. We're going to first understand how Cisco Unified Communication Manager Express works, understand the Cisco Unified Communication Manager, uh, Cisco Unity Connection, Presence and IM, Video Communication Server and Telepresence Management Suite, uh, such as VCS Control, Expressway, Management Suite, uh, TMS, as well as Conductor. So the first one is Cisco Unified Communication Manager Express or CUCME with the E at the end or sometimes known as Call Manager Express. It is a feature based on iOS that turns a Cisco router into an IP based PVX. So when the Cisco router becomes an IP based PVX with a proper interface you can actually power the phone using a Cisco iOS router. It provides call processing, so when you dial an extension or look, uh, you want to receive a call, the router will process the call on behalf of you. The phone must be registered to the router under the device control of the CUCME. Now, you can manage this system using a command line or a GUI-based configuration, uh, graphical user interface. And it also has the capability to create a local directory service so that you can search by someone's last name or first name. Now, if you have a Call Manager Express or CUCME Express, you can interconnect that with a third-party application provided that it supports CTI or Computer Telephone Integration. To connect to another PVX such as Call Manager or Avaya or a Mitel, Shortel, you can use a SIP trunking between those two devices. Now, Cisco Unified Communication Manager can directly integrate with Cisco Unity Express, which is a voicemail solution for small business. C CME or Cisco Unified Communication Manager interact with Cisco IP phone using either SIP or Skinny protocol, SCCP. Now, SCCP is a proprietary protocol developed by Cisco for only Cisco phone. SIP, on the other hand, is a little bit more standard, but depending on the image that you're using. The router itself can act as a PVX, provides a dial tone to this particular phone as soon as they are connected and registered. The protocol that they use could be either SIP or Skinny or a bit of both. Once the destination phone, once the phones are registered, you can dial from your phone the call signal will come into the router. If a number is matched, it will then send a signal to the destination phone. Once the destination phone answers the call, there will be direct communication between this phone and the, direct, uh, the destination phone between them directly. Once the call, because in that scenario, what's the, what they're going to use here is RTP, the last chapter we talked about in the previous uh, video. Now, because the RTP is between the two IP phone, point to point, in this case scenario, if the call manager express router goes down, the call will continue to function because the RTP is between them directly. However, any new call that you're trying to establish will not work. To establish the call, the phone has to initiate a signal to the router. But once the signal is initiated and the, phone, the destination phone answers the call, the communication is directly between the end devices. So therefore, the presence of the router is no longer required. But new call or you cannot initiate a transfer, things like that. Now, Cisco Unified Communication Manager, which is the full version, is a server-based solution that is designed to work on a Linux platform uh, on a VMware appliance. Also does device control, registering the phone, resetting the phone, registering the gateway, resetting the gateway. It does call routing, dial four digit, 11 digit number, uh, gives permission to user for various functions and features. It supports 
full audio and video telephony it's an appliance based operation so therefore you cannot run or install any other software on the same server that is running the unified communication manager installs on VMware only nowadays it has a redundant server clustering concept so that if it's in case one server goes down you have multiple other servers that can communicate intercluster and voice gateway control so it allows you to inter create an intercluster link between all the servers and it can control all the voice gateways it does have a built-in disaster recovery or DRS for backup and restore and it has a built-in directory service or can be integrated with third-party LDAP server now the call manager server uh, typically deployed in a cluster a cluster is basically consists of one or more two or more server working together to serve the endpoint there are two type of communication happens in a cluster a database replication and a runtime data the database replication which is based on IBM Informix database that's the name of the database that will include all the static data on the cluster such as when you add a phone when you add a gateway those are static they don't change regularly so those information will be stored into the Informix database now the very first server that you install in your cluster is known as publisher that's the very first server now in a cluster you cannot have more than one publisher if you happen to create a two server with a role of publisher technically what you really have is two cluster so the publisher will replicate this data the static data to read-only database that are hosted by all the subsequent server in the cluster known as subscriber so in a given server you can have up to 20 server acting as pub and subscriber together but only eight of them then that can do call processing now the runtime data the runtime data encompass anything that happens in the real time such as all the communication between the phone as it happens now all servers in CUCM cluster will form a TCP session with each other using ICCS communication protocol intercluster control uh, signaling uh, is it using a TCP port 8002 to 8004 the amount of network traffic generated by ICCS is variable it's assuming that for every 10,000 busy hour call attempt ICC will generate 1.5 Mbps per server now the Informix database which is use a one-way push from the publisher to the subscriber the publisher is the master database changes to the database are implemented on the publisher only and then replicated to the changes in the subscriber is the read-only copy the standard call manager cluster support a single publisher and up to 19 subscribers eight of those total 20 servers can be configured for call processing where the IP phone can be registered to the remaining server can be dedicated to roles such as TFTP server, conference bridge, music and hall, announcer, so and so. In a smaller and a budget environment, it is okay to use the publisher for both database management and call processing. But for high availability environment, it is not a recommended solution. Cisco Unity Cisco Unity is a voicemail server for IP telephony. It is based on a skinny protocol or SIP protocol. Prove it's an appliance based, so therefore nothing can be run on the same server. Single server can handle 20,000 mailbox, so if you have more than 20,000, multiple servers are required. Access to the voicemail can be from anywhere, from an IP phone, from an email, from a smartphone, doesn't really matter. LDAP directory can be integrated so that centralized user name repository, uh, sorry, centralized user account are stored, such as Microsoft Active Directory or um, Open LDAP and so on and so. Unity connection can be integrated with the Microsoft Exchange so that when somebody leaves a voicemail to you, it can be sent to you as an email. 
And if you, if you want to interconnect your voicemail system with a third-party voicemail system or your voicemail system with maybe you may have another Unity connection somewhere else and you want to interconnect them, you will use the voicemail profile for Internet Mail to do that, VPIM. Now, Unity connection can be deployed in active, active, high availability. Unity connection also use a publisher and subscribers clustering similar to call manager. Both server can accept client requests, giving it an active, active redundancy role. The largest Unity connection VMware deployment can support up to 250 voicemail port. Not number of voicemail mailbox, but voicemail port. Port represent number of simultaneous communication between these two devices. By creating a high availability pair, you can now support 500 voicemail port because each server can handle 250. However, if one of the server in the Unity connection failover fails, then all 20,000 20, mailbox that are still available, but the number of voicemail port will be reduced down to minimum, maximum supported by single server. So the number of voicemail mailbox that you have will be supported, but only 250 port will be used. So in a nutshell, that Unity connection can run simultaneously both in active active failover mode so both server can provide service to the customer if one server goes down the other server can provide the service uh, they will still support 20,000 mailbox however like I said the number of voicemail port will be reduced down now presence presence or instant messaging is like a enterprise chat and instant messaging solution for a company if a company wants to provide a service like a, a Skype or a Microsoft Live Messenger which is Skype anyway now uh, they can do that by using a Cisco unified presence server it is a messaging server uh, message compliance it allows you to interconnect your messaging server with let's say Yahoo Messenger or a third-party messaging service known as Interdomain Federation. Now, pre Presence use a protocol called XCP. Uh, allows a Jabber, which is a client, uh, to register with the Presence uh, server. So the chat, instant chat, can be done using a client known as Jabber client. Cisco Jabber, which is a software-based client for a soft phone, Presence, instant messaging, visual voicemail, employee directory, communication history, video, and web conferencing. All can be performed from a one single application. Jabber serves as an in IM client, supporting peer to peer chat and a multi user chat and a persistence chat. Now, the video communication server and telepresence. As of uh, the new update Cisco made to C uh, with the introduction to CCNP collaboration, the major focus on CCNP or CCNA collaboration is the video. And Cisco under in Cisco, all the video components configure uh, devices are categorized under an umbrella known as telepresence. Telepresence is a collection of products working together to provide a video-based solution either for video call or video conferencing. Cisco VCS or video communication server can be categorized into two categories, control and expressway. Video, uh, telepresence calls are typically managed by VCS and a telepresence management suite, which is kind of a uh, management suite uh, allows you to manage all the VCS server. VCS control is a self-contained video endpoint call control system. No call manager cluster is needed. All you need just the endpoint. VCS Expressway is very similar to VCS Control, but it is for the endpoint that does not have VCS Control but would like to set up a video call to an endpoint that are registered to the call manager inside your organization. When you have a VCS Control and Expressway working together, you are going to need something known as Firewall Traversal, which is a connection handled by the VCS Control and Expressway to establish a secure communication. Now we'll talk more about that in a telepresence section in module number five. Uh, the VCS server that sits at the end of the firewall or outside the company is known as the edge. 
which sits on a demilitarized zone outside the firewall and has a trusted relationship with the VCS core or control inside the firewall. Telepresence Management Suite, which is a powerful and a complex and a valuable system. Provisioning tools to simplify the rapid deployment thousands of telepresence users and endpoints across the multiple locations within an organization. So it's like a central application to manage all your video infrastructure. Uh, Real-time management of all conferences using telepresence, you can actually manage a location, conference services, resources, or whatever available. Provide you access to the conference room so that you can book those rooms. Built-in ready-to-use report in addition to provide customized reporting capability. From an end-user perspective, Telepresence Management Suite allows ease of scheduling, including integration with Exchange and Outlook scheduling, single button or single click to initiate a telepresence call. So by using Outlook, just press a button, it will initiate a video conferencing. It also use of uh, ease of use for contacts and phone book management. Telepresence Conductor, oops, is a separate software which allows endpoint with a sufficient privilege to seamlessly create and enter a conference by dialing a single number or URI. URI is like a kind of an email address concept. Integrated tightly with Telepresence Video Communication Server, VCS, and MCU product. MCU is like a hardware device that provides conference bridge. Uh, MCU, which provide conference bridge resource management, is performed by automatically by the telepresence conductor. Calls are routed to appropriate conference bridge by the VCS under the instruction from the conductor. So think about the conductor, like you know when you go to like those uh, music show like uh, Oprah music and you get this one guy uh, facing all the uh, what do you call the musicians or playing the violin and whatnot and he's kind of directing everything. So conductor is something very similar to that. It's directing or locating the resources based on uh, various criteria. Now these are some of the applications we'll be exploring more details as we go along throughout the course. Now if you are someone who's going to go CCNP collaboration, you're going to have to learn how to configure, manage, and telepresence suite. The next topic we're going to focus on gateways, one of the most important topic of voice over IP. In order for gate, uh, gateways are kind of uh, a device that allows you to connect IP telephony or voice over IP to the old telephone system. But also today, gateways are also used to connect one voice over IP network to another voice over IP network. But that's just like any communication. For two devices to communicate, for two devices to communicate, they must speak the same language. Now the question is, like for example, for you to understand me, I speak two lang three languages. Uh, for you to uh, Hindi, Bengali, and English, for example. Now for you to understand me, if I, we both have to speak the same language or we must be from the same country. Now you speak English, I speak English, we both speak the same, so therefore you're able to understand me. So same similar concept to uh, gateway. So the protocol a signaling protocol which is used by two communication two devices to communicate is basically a set of instruction and these are the following four signaling protocols that are available and whenever you are configuring voice devices they must support any of these four devices four protocol H.323 MGCP SIP and Skinny H.323 which was managed and uh, managed by ITU, International Telecommunication Union. Because it is one of the oldest protocol that exists, it is very good in vendor neutrality because almost everybody is K, uh, pretty much support uh, H.323. Used on gateways but not on Cisco IP phone. And this concept of H.323 is known as a peer-to-peer -peer concept. Now there are two types of architecture for voice gateway peer-to-peer -peer or client server. Now H.323 is actually a subset of the ISDN protocol whereas 
IETF or Internet Engineering Task Force organization responsible for Internet uh, came up with uh, their own signaling protocol known as MGCP Media Gateway Control Protocol which is uh, reasonably good vendor neutrality meaning that one gateway will most likely work with the other gateway used on Cisco gateway but not very limited number of phones support MGCP and the concept of MGCP is a client server architecture so we'll talk about more details in a few shortly now the emerging protocol is the SIP session initiation protocol which is also uh, um, controlled by IETF the standard body uh, is good uh, basic to good I would say vendor neutrality in neutrality because pretty much everybody is now creating device that support uh, SIP uh, used on uh, voice gateways and definitely used on all Cisco IP phone latest version but it's also a peer-to-peer -peer architecture SCCP or skinny is the Cisco's proprietary protocol that was designed for Cisco phone only very limited number of gateways do support it proprietary so the third party cannot use this particular protocol and it is also a client server the next few slides will explain each one of them into more detail but before we do that let's talk about what is ISDN ISDN is known as integrated service digital network it is a protocol that is designed to for audio and a video as well as data what ISDN does set, provide set of communication standard for simultaneous digital transmission of voice, video, and data, and other network services over a traditional telephone circuit, or PSTN. It offers circuit switch connection for either voice or data, and packet switch connection for data only, an increment of 64 kilobits per second. So ISDN can be used for both voice call or data. Now if you're using it for voice call it's going to be used known as circuit switch connection. But if you're using the ISDN for data it's going to be a packet switch connection. Now ITU recommend that you use Q.931 protocol for ISDN standard for connection control signaling protocol. Q.931 is the layer 3 protocol of the ISDN which does not necessarily cre uh, carry any user data. Q931 was designed for ISDN for, to establish a call, maintenance of the call, release of the connection between the two uh, DTE device, which is basically the uh, endpoint device. ISDN Q931 contains things like source and destination number, the number you call, the number you call from, information elements such as you know call is busy or you know caller ID will be carried over the information element and the reason code the reason why the call was successfully connected or disconnected ISDN Q921 on the other hand is layer 2 part of the protocol which consists of three layers physical data link and network Q921 often referred as a link access procedure on D channel which is provide a reliable transport for layer 3 signaling Q931 uh, provide identification of the frame provide flow control mechanism for data transmission and reception ISDN uh, Q921 deals with layer 2 functionality of the packet now the most easiest way to identify layer 2 and layer 3 just look at the second digit of the number 3 and 2 that tells you which one is layer 2, which one is layer 3. Always remember, layer 3 contains the phone number that you are trying to dial and the caller ID of where you're calling from. All right, having said that, ISDN is the signal used by the PSTN. So when PSTN sending calls to your organization, they're going to use ISDN to send the signals to you. Now let's talk about H.323 gateway. H.323 gateway is a peer-to-peer -peer protocol. So here is one H.323 gateway and call manager is also H.323 gateway. When you have a router connecting to the PSTN such as Bell Canada, Verizon, Etisalat, BSNL, 
they're going to have a, some sort of T1 and E1 connection coming in here. When a call comes in, remember I said ISDN signal will be used? Well, the service provider will send you these two packets to the router. The router will receive those two packets, and because ISDN, sorry, H.323 is a peer to peer, what the router is going to do, router is going to intercept these two packets, it's going to extract the information from ISDN Q931, which remember contains the phone number, to decide what to do with the call next. So both ISDN Q921 and Q931 will terminate on the router. The router will decide, based on the information available on ISDN Q931, what to do with the call next. Where do I route the call? So this is one of the reasons where in a peer-to-peer -peer device or protocol, the router must have dial plan matching the number that it found on ISDN Q931 messages. So therefore, each ISD, uh, H323 gateway must have its dial plan pointing to the final destination. Now, assume that you have a dial plan on the router, the router will then send a signal to the remote device, such as a call manager, by initiating an H225 and H245 packet. So ISDN 3, uh, 323 consists of two packets, H225 and H245. H225 is the call signal call signal where you you know hear the ring ring back so and so h245 is the negotiation capability negotiation such as uh, Kodak transparent uh, what Kodak you're using uh, the logical channel to use and so and so both h225 and h245 must be initiated in order to establish the call and they must be successfully completed if the call manager receives the signal from H323, what the call manager is going to do, extract the Q931 portion of the message and find out what is the phone number it is trying to reach. So the call manager also should have a dial plan matching the same destination number, which is the IP address extension number of this phone. Now, so the nut, in, a, in a nutshell, in H.323, which happens to be peer-to-peer, -peer, both Q921 and Q931 will terminate on the router. The router will process the ISDN Q931 message, match the destination number from that message against a dial plan in the router. So therefore, the dial plan must exist here. Send the call across the WAN or LAN using H225 and H245. Call manager will analyze the number from the Q931 Look, at, look for that number against his own dial plan. So therefore, call manager must have his dial plan and then finally reach the destination. So this behavior is exactly the same for both H.323 H as well as SIP. When we register this gateway into the call manager, because the nature of peer-to-peer -peer that each gateway does not control the other gateway, in this case, the call manager does not control the uh, iOS gateway, an iOS gateway does not control the call manager. If for some reason, if for some reason this T1 is down, the call manager does not have any knowledge about that, does not know about that, because as long as the IP connection to the gateway is fine, the call manager consider, to, consider the gateway to be up. But there are ways to do redundancy. Because the reason why they don't know anything about it because each gateway, such as the call manager and the router, do not exchange any information. So when we add this gateway into the call manager based on the IP address of the gateway, the registration status of this gateway will always remain unknown.
The next protocol is called MGCP, Media Gateway Control Protocol. Uh, it's uh, initially developed by Cisco, but then it was become a standard. MGCP is a very simple, contains a very simple endpoint, which can be either analog or a digital port. Uh, in an MGCP, which happens to be a client server, has a master and a slave relationship between the call manager, which is acting as the MGCP uh, call, central call intelligent agent, or, or the master, and the gateway acting as a slave. So the call manager will control the gateway at any given time. So all the voice traffic will still be carried over the Q, uh, UDP protocol. Now in this environment, when a signal comes in from the PSTN, remember the ISDN Q921 and 31? Q921 will terminate into the router. However, Q931 will be passed directly to the call manager, so they'll basically go through the router. Because the router is not intercepting the ISDN Q931 packet, the router does not need a dial plan. The call manager does, because that's where the Q931 will terminate. So the call manager will be responsible for managing all the dial plans. So in an MGCP environment, all the gateways, the routers, do not necessarily have any dial plan. Therefore, it is easier to manage. SIP, which is Session Initiation Protocol, uh, use a request and response method to establish a communication. The SIP identification of a user is based on unique phone or extension number in a form of email address such as user ID at the domain name.com. In order to communicate between a SIP and an H2 uh, call manager, you must create a SIP trunk between this gateway. Again, same concept as H323. Both Q921 and Q931 terminates on the router. Router must have a dial plan matching the information available in the Q931 message and then send it across to the call manager using session discovery protocol. The next generation gateway called Cube, Cisco Unified Border Element. Cisco Unified Border Element, which is basically an iOS feature of a router, makes it a session border controller. It is implemented on iOS Gateway using a special iOS release. It has the ability to connect one VoIP dial pit to another. It allows you to do protocol uh, internet working between H323 and SIP, between H323 to H323, SIP to H323, or SIP to SIP. Remember I said that between the two endpoints, they must speak the same language or signaling protocol. Well, if they, in case, cannot speak the same language or internet uh, signaling protocol, you must have a cube in between where one side of the cube will be H323, other side will be SIP, and the cube will be doing the protocol translation. In addition to protocol translation, cube can also do uh, media proxy, meaning that instead of having RTP between the endpoints, RTP will also go through the cube for more security reason. So that's the, pretty much the overview of uh, Unified Communication Application. So that's it for this particular chapter, and I'll see you in the next.